In this video, we'll look at the combination of linear models and gradient descent in a classification setting. This is an example we also saw in the previous lecture, where this was our example dataset. Let's start with the question of how we define a linear decision boundary like this using the formula that we've already seen. The most practical method turns out to be to define a linear function as before on our feature space. So we have the same parameters on our feature space as before, one weight for every feature plus one bias term. And where this function is larger than zero, we assign it one class. And where this function is smaller than zero, we assign it the other. The decision boundary then is the set of points for which this function is equal to zero. For now, we'll stick to binary classification later in the course we'll see some techniques for dealing with multiple classes. Here's what that looks like from the side. If we have just one feature x, then we define a linear function as before, which gives us some value y. We're not really interested in this value y. We just say if y is higher than 0, we assign one class. And if y is lower than 0, we assign the other class. Here's what it looks like for two features. We can imagine this linear function as a hyperplane above our feature space that intersects our feature space at some point, And that intersection forms a line within our feature space. Now, since we know from the previous videos that the slope, this vector w, is the direction of steepest descent, we also know that this is the direction orthogonal to the line that intersects our feature space. In other words, if we define our model in this way, with a weight vector w, then this vector w points in the direction orthogonal to our decision boundary. To simplify things, we'll again look at a very small example data set consisting of just six points, six points which can easily be separated with a linear decision boundary. As before, we have two more questions to answer. One, what is our loss function? Two, how are we going to search our model class? And in the previous lecture, this is the loss function we suggested, the number of instances in our training data that our model misclassifies. This is a very reasonable loss function. Essentially, this is what we want to minimize. So let's start there. What if we take this as a loss function? What does our loss surface then look like? It looks like this. Note that actually, in this case, our model space has three dimensions because we now have three parameters. So in order to plot this in two dimensions, we have fixed w2 to 1. But practically, this is the sort of shape our loss surface takes, except in three dimensions. And the main takeaway here is that this loss surface consists only of large flat regions where the loss doesn't change. Because usually, if we change this, uh, this line that forms our decision boundary a little bit, we either misclassify the same number of points, because the line doesn't separate any new points, or it crosses a point and the loss changes abruptly. What we never get is a smooth loss, where if we change the line a tiny little bit, the loss also changes a tiny little bit, and that tiny little bit we can make as small as possible. We always get large regions of unchanging loss with sudden large jumps. The consequence for our search is that if we, for instance, use random search, if it starts anywhere in this large black region at the top right, it's essentially doing a random walk because all its successors will have the same loss as itself. And it needs to random walk until it finds one of these transitions to a different flat area. Gradient descent fares even worse. Since these areas are flat, the gradient is zero almost everywhere. And in that case, gradient descent simply doesn't move. And on, the ra on these rare boundaries between areas of the same color, the gradient is undefined because the loss doesn't change smoothly. So then gradient descent is likely to crash if we implement it naively. In short, with a jaggy non-smooth loss function like this, most search methods won't work very well. And this is an important lesson. Sometimes our loss function should not be the same as our evaluation function. And by evaluation function, we mean the function that we're actually interested in minimizing Sometimes we can make that the same as our loss function, but sometimes we want to find a loss function that has a minimum at the same point as the evaluation function, but is actually smooth so that it becomes easier to search. For classification, we'll look at three different kinds of loss function. First, we'll look at the least squares loss in this video, 
This is not a very good loss function for classification and it isn't used very often, but it helps us to explain the basic principle. And then in future lectures, we'll look at log loss, which is also known as cross entropy loss and at support vector machine loss. But for now, let's look at least squares loss. The basic idea of least squares loss is that we simply assign a number to both of our classes, a positive number to the blue class and a negative number to the red class. And then we treat the problem as if it were a linear regression problem. So we, even though these dots do not form a line, we simply try to fit a line through them anyway. We look where this line intersects the horizontal axis and we make that our decision boundary. So written as a formula, our loss function as before is a sum of squares, but we divide the data set into two subsets, the positive points and the negative points. And the positive points we give the label one and the negative points we give the label minus one. And we fit a linear function to this data set as we did before with regression. If we do that, we can plot our loss surface and it looks like this. And for this very easy data set, this loss function is good enough. And we can find a minimum in this loss landscape. And when we plot that minimum, we see that it does actually find a separation between the blue and the red points. The Playground app also allows you to play around with classification. And that looks like this. Here we see a data set of blue and orange points and a randomly chosen classifier that doesn't separate them very well. So we'll set the learning rate to a low value so that it doesn't converge too quickly. And if we hit play, we see that the classifier slowly finds a separation of the two point clouds. We should note that this demo doesn't actually use the loss function of least squares loss. It uses a, a version of logarithmic loss, but the basic principle is the same. We can see also that if we select a data set that cannot be classified linearly, this search algorithm doesn't know what to do and sort of moves around in this space without ever landing on a definitive choice. That's the end of the lecture. Let's look back at what we've learned. We've looked at different black box optimization methods, things like random search, simulated annealing, and evolutionary methods. These are simple. They work on discrete model spaces, and they don't require us to know anything about the internals of our model. We've looked at gradient descent, which is a more powerful method, but it only works on continuous model spaces. And it only works when we know the insides of our model so that we can work out the gradient. So if you don't quite understand it, make sure to go back over the slides, look at the homework, and if you're still struggling, ask your teaching assistant for a little more explanation. And we've looked at classification. And we saw that in classification, it's important to find a smooth loss function to replace the thing we're actually interested in. And we've looked at the first of our replacement loss functions, the least square loss. And later in the course, we'll see some other loss functions that we can use as well. That brings us to the end of the lecture. In the next two lectures, instead of looking at more models and more search methods, we'll look at what to do before and after applying this basic machine learning recipe, how to prepare your data, and after you've trained a model, how to evaluate its performance.